Welcome to the Animal Training Academy podcast show. I'm your host, Ryan Carlidge. I know that you're here because you want to master your animal training skills using a force-free approach. And to handle the variety of challenges you face, you need a broad knowledge and experience base. The problem is we all get stuck and hit rough patches in our training, which can leave us feeling overwhelmed and helpless. Our mission since 2015 is to empower trainers just like you. The Animal Training Academy has helped thousands of trainers globally to develop skills, gain confidence, and positively influence both animal and human learners. Here's how we can do the same for you. Sign up for our membership waitlist at www.atamember.com. Register when our doors open, email arrives, and start growing your training skills. Build impactful training practices, benefiting you and those you train. So join the waitlist at www.atamember.com. And while waiting, enjoy this free podcast show. We want to see you avoid embarrassment, overwhelm, and burnout. Instead, We want to see you build resilience to setbacks, get more organized, and grow your training skills and knowledge. In short, we want to see you enjoy confidence in yourself as a trainer and lead a fulfilling life, positively impacting the lives of the animal and human learners you work with. But we will start today's episode where we will talk to one Francesca de Yi Espinosa. Francesca's journey in ABA began with a child of autism who had limited words, shaping her career. She became the lead clinician for the first UK-based EIBI outcome study and earned a PhD in psychology under Professor Bob Remington at the University of Southampton. Currently, Francesca's focuses on translating cognitive insights into a technology to help children with autism. Her work centers on early social responsiveness, generative verbal behavior, and theory of mind. In 2023, she received the Clinical Supervisor Award in Verbal Behavior from ABAI. She runs a diagnostic clinic in the UK teaching advanced behavior analysis in Italy, the UK, and the US. Francesca is a board member of the BF Skinner Foundation and a student in the KEPA professional program. She lives in Southampton, UK with her husband, one of her three sons preparing for university, and her two dogs who inspire her to be a better behavior analyst. So without further ado, it's my very great pleasure to welcome Francesca to the show today, who's patiently waiting by. Francesca, thank you so much for taking the time to come and hang out with us at Animal Training Academy. Hi, Ryan. Thank you. It's lovely to be here. And a huge shout out to our mutual colleague, the awesome Ava Bertelson, who said, I must have you on this show. So we are super grateful to Ava. Yes, I am very grateful to Ava for everything she's taught me so far. So um, whatever she says, I do. (laughs) Well, I think the listeners of the show would enjoy hearing and connecting the dots uh, to how this podcast came to be. Now, you, the listener of this show, might not know who Ava Bertelson is. Uh, If not, then you're welcome for introducing you to that name because she is amazing. Go and search her name in our podcast lineup. Uh, For a lot of you, though, you'll know who Ava is. And if you're like me and Francesca, she's had a big impact on you and your understanding of the practical application of what we do with the science and apply it to our non-human learners and our human learners. And you, if you're like us, have huge respect for her. Uh, So I think people might enjoy hearing how you and Ava came into contact and and the relationship you guys have and why Ava recommended that you must be on our show. Do you mind sharing that story with our listeners, Francesca? Yeah, I can. Um, So actually, Eva met, was aware of me before I was aware of her because 
I didn't have dogs at the time that I gave any, in fact, the closing keynote at the Sweden um, Association for Behavior Analysis Conference. Um, this was a few years ago. I think it may have been 2019, 17, something like that. Um, and um, a common friend, we have DAG, um, and the committee invited me to give the closing on theory of mind, which is one of my um, topics um, with a, obviously a VB, verbal behavior interpretation on it. Um, and then the pandemic came and as many people, I thought it would be a good idea to completely change my life and stop traveling for work altogether. Um, it kind of led to a really deep dive into what were my reinforcers, um, what were my values. And one of them was to feel more grounded, to feel like I had more of a base and a life in the place that I was living, which was the UK. I was, you know, literally globe trotting. I was traveling around the world probably for 10 days to two weeks every month. So I lived out of a suitcase, which then makes it really difficult when you're home, even though you're not working so much, to pick up your life again, make connections, see people, uh, reacquaint yourself with the routines of family life. Um, and I just didn't realize that that wasn't, it was a life full of, um, by all means, adventures and, and lots of good things about it. Um, but also I didn't engage in contacting other reinforcers that suddenly became available with the pandemic. And um, where I, you know, the pandemic was an awful time for a lot of people. And I, you know, I had a lot of concerns and a lot of worries. My, my business is based on direct clinical supervision. And suddenly that went. Um, so I was concerned about my family's livelihood. Um, but somehow I got through it. We economized. We made various you know, changes. Um, and I thought, you know what, after a few months, I thought I could see this being my permanent life now and being at home. And one of the things that I would have always had liked was uh, for my kids to grow up with a dog uh, because I, I'd, all, I'd grown up with dogs. My parents always had dogs, um, but my life just didn't really um, enable me to do that with so much traveling. And so we um, initially, I, I was pretty certain I did not want a male. Um, my parents had both males and females, and the males were always a, a bit more challenging than the females. Um, but my main, <laughs> I was so naive, and my main worry about having a male was that they would harm, um, because we had a dog who did a lot of that. People, blankets, anything that was vertical and fluffy. And and that was like my main concern. That's why I didn't want a male dog. Um, and I also did not want a puppy because, um, and this may sound strange for someone who is committed to a developmental approach, developmental behavioral approaches that I don't particularly like, like really young infants um, in that, <laughs> I know it sounds weird, um, at least my own infants, um, you know, they just didn't do very much. Um, and I, I like behavior and I like movement. And so, um, so I did not want a puppy because I didn't feel I was equipped to um, provide that puppy the attention necessary to, and I, I just didn't know how to raise a dog in any way. So in my imaginary world, I was going to find a two to three, four, five-year-old female dog, fully grown, who knew everything and behaved really well um, in a new environment. That was 
what I, you know, thought I was going to find. But of course, at least in the UK, everybody had the same idea. And so when I contacted the various shelters, they were pretty empty. Like there were no dogs available or it was really difficult to access. So I reconsidered and thought, okay, let's um, try and find a puppy. And, you know, not ever having, you know, lived with my own dog. It was always my parents' dogs. Um, I thought, well, what is the one breed that is known to be relatively easy as a first owner, first caregiver, first family, first dog in a family and the Labrador. Um, And my husband, who was still living in the US, had always had Labradors. So it seemed a reasonable, it seemed a safe choice. And um, of course, I ended up with a male lab because I just fell in love with him. And um, also because we already, we had a really cool name and we couldn't think of an equivalent name uh, for a female. So Darwin arrived at eight weeks and God, was it difficult. I, um, he was just different from not just my like Disney dog vision, but, but I realized pretty quickly that he was also different from all the other dogs that puppies that I was, you know, attending online classes with. We did attend an outdoor puppy class and he was just not like the others and certainly not like any of the other Labradors. I always say Darwin did not read his breed job description. He was not interested in having things in his mouth. He wasn't interested in people. And the most concerning part was that he really wasn't that interested in food. And you can imagine as a behavior analyst, um, you know, my um, as someone who works with a population that's not sensitive to the conventional reinforces, social engagement, playing and interaction. And so I spend a lot of my time trying to establish those as reinforces and finding the things that, you know, would be meaningful to that child that would kind of engage them. This was really challenging for me. Um, And I sought information everywhere. We saw a range of trainers. Um, Nobody could really give me the answers I was seeking. They gave me a lot of procedures, but none of those procedures linked to the principles and behavioral processes that I knew. And so I did a lot. It it really, that's why I say Darwin made me a better behavior analyst because it kind of took me back to my roots. I'm saying, okay, you have a problem. What are the controlling variables? And I started listening to, um, the first person I contacted actually was Chirac Patel, who um, obviously was, you know, famous. And um, that's another interesting story because I contacted Chirac. He agreed to see me online for um, some the, the time that he had. And he said, I, I really enjoyed your talk on how we could look at other approaches. And he was specifically referring to developmental approaches and how how we can use our behavioral lens. I'm like, what what lecture is that that you listened to? Are you sure it was me? Um and and then it transpired that um I had been teaching at Belfast. I I taught verbal behavior there at the university there. And Chirac was taking classes in the master schools. So he had actually, like, again, he he knew me, but I had no, um, I I didn't know who he was at the time, obviously, because there was, I didn't have a dog. So Chirac helped a little bit. And then um, we kind of lost touch. and then I stumble onto drinking from the toilet by Hannah. 
Brennigan. And I thought, wow, these people really understand behavior analysis. Like they don't just have procedures and recipes. They don't just have a technology that can also link them back to behavioral principles and processes. And I listened to Eva, um, a couple of Eva's talks and um, with her, with Emily, her business partner. And I was amazed because they described what I strive to do every day with my learners, building great session structure, ensuring your learner has clear cues for um, or clear contextual arrangements for reinforcement, um, that you're clean and focused. Um, ha, um, so this idea of an, intercontent, an interconnected chain of kind of mutually mediated uh, discriminative stimuli and reinforcers. And it was the first time I'd heard uh, an animal trainer person talk in this way. Uh, sort of what I'd heard until now was, until then, was the quadrants. And I'm like, there's so much more. Um, I didn't even know the word quadrants. And I've been in behavior analysis for 25 years. And it, it is not a word that I was aware of. And so I contacted Eva and I said, I. And we had got by then, you know, Darwin by then was 18 months. So we were doing a lot better. I kind of found my way through um, uh, some of our challenges. And, um, you know, we had a decent um, a decent relationship, for lack of a better word, because I still think that those things need to be operationally defined. Um, and I thought we were ready to maybe take on a little bit more. And I was seeking a mentor. So I didn't just want someone who could tell me how to teach something or what would be important to teach Darwin um, by which time my second dog arrived. Um, but I wanted someone to explain to me uh, the how, the why. why. Why does it work this way? Um, what are the controlling variables behind the procedures you're putting in place? And Eva was able to do that. And, um, she, you know, we would have these Zoom calls where we had absolutely no goal. And it would be all about building this kind of um, seamless um, movement cycles. Um, with no interruption in that kind of mutually engaged chain. And then, you know, back to station and then out again. And things just clicked uh, for both me and Darwin. By then I had Lolly, who was a rescue. She was, um, she must have been a few months. And I did things completely differently with her. Um, I didn't follow any of the recipes I'd been given at puppy classes or by, um, you know, that I'd seen in various courses because I, I, I felt I, I had, I, I wanted to do things differently with her. Um, I wanted her to seek me out. I wanted her to approach me uh, and, and, and be eager for the next thing that we were going to do together. And Eva was able to not only provide a technology, so the, in a way, the recipe, the, the operations, that I the actions I would need to engage in to make it happen. So the sort of specific arrangement of the contingencies, how to do it. But, um, but she was able to be conceptually systematic and define the moment-to-moment -moment changes from stimulus control to motivating operation. She was just able to, we were able to have these conversations. So we would just have these sessions where we had no goal, but but something would come out. And what came out was um was was beautiful. 
And so I credit her for showing me how to put it together with my dogs. But I guess the biggest change was that um, it it sharpened my skills as a behavior analyst for my humans. Um, and, you know, Eva is a great friend now for which I am very grateful. Uh, and I continue to learn from her. So agree that Ava is very good at a word I picked out of what you said there was seamlessly mm -hmm. engaging with her, her learners. So watching her is inspiring, educational, uh, incredibly reinforcing, um, but her ability to, to communicate to you with your knowledge that you have and, mm -hmm. and BA um, credentials and practical application with other earthlings, but human earthlings uh, definitely can appreciate that and, and enjoy uh, thinking about uh, the conversations that you two must have had on your Zoom calls. I've had many with Ava as well, but I, I don't have anywhere near the breadth of knowledge that you have. So I'm keen to sit in on one of those calls uh, one day. Um, mm -hmm. I'm I'm wanting to go back towards more the start of what you're sharing then, and yeah, you were talking about um, wanting to get a a dog and wanting a female and wanting a specific breed. I didn't want a specific breed actually. I didn't at all. I I wanted a fully formed Disney dog. <laughs> wanting a Disney dog, and yes. and I'm curious. I'm curious about you, you said you said when you were talking and when you were sharing about that. You said you acknowledged that you thought that was naive. Oh gosh! <laughs> and I, and I'm curious about what what lessons you want if you, if you have any. Um, I'm asking this question with an assumption that you have some. Um, but what lessons ca came from that that are valuable to be shared with our listeners in terms of someone traveling the world as as a behavior analyst doing this as a living, month in month out. Uh, and one would not be judged or criticized or thought silly for thinking, oh, if this person got a dog, they, they will mm -hmm. be fine. They understand behavior. They can cross that species gap. Mm -hmm. They can bridge that divide between the humans <laughs> they work with and the dogs. I mean, they're working with humans that are nonverbal and these are very challenging contexts. This person will be fine, mm -hmm. but you 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 labelled yourself <laughs> as naive. <laughs> oh gosh, what, I think what what's the list? What's the big takeaway there for you that you think would be valuable for all of us trainers who don't have your background working with humans in the context you do? It, it's a good question. I think yes, I, I can answer in a couple of ways. My um, my self report my reporting on me being naive simply meant that I did not have all the information available um no and and perhaps I didn't seek them sufficiently so that's absolutely on me um about the challenges that can arise from um you know raising a puppy and to a, a, a well-rounded, um, I don't like using adjectives, so, but, you know, confident, well-balanced um, dog. I, I mean, I understood that it would be, you know, a, a, a long-term commitment. I was prepared for that, but I didn't realize the amount of work and heartache that it would generate when things weren't quite right from the beginning. So in my self-defense, uh, because I have had many, many months, if not a couple of years of, of self-flagellation, as in, and just, just verbal self-flagellation, obviously, um, of, of feeling responsible for some of Darwin's challenges, they were there from the very beginning. I just didn't, I, I didn't, 
my observation skills weren't good enough to see them. Um, so I will say that in in my sort of just to be kind to myself because I spent many sleepless nights saying, have I caused this? Um, and it is true that sometime as humans, and I see this with kids, I work with parents, and of course, the problems, the challenges are not in the individual, they're in the contingencies, they're in the environment to a certain extent. I think it's important to say that, that um, that it is an interaction between one's genetic endowment and the environment. Um, I think my naivety came from thinking it's a puppy, I can shape it. I can provide the relevant environment. I, and the challenge for me as a seasoned behavior analyst who has dealt with very severe, life-threatening, challenging behavior and has you know, navigated these individuals to the other side where they can live you know, with the quality of life that, that the, the environment can give them despite their difficulties, um, I knew that I needed to learn about a new population, that my behavioral prints, you know, my behavioral background wouldn't have been enough. So I wasn't naive with that. I knew I had to understand the, the you know, what it was to be a dog, you know, in the same way that if I'm going to be working with a new um client or a new learner who isn't on the spectrum but has a different um uh maybe um has a different condition um i would need to understand those the differences and strengths um so i wasn't that presumptuous to believe hey i'm this great behavior analyst course give me a dog and I'll you know turn it into what I need to be no but I didn't think it was that hard and you know my the lady who comes into a house to help out she got a dog around the same time and I I know for a fact she didn't put in as much effort as I did um from the very beginning Mickey is the most bulletproof dog I have ever met. He is super friendly. He will, you know, you can hand him over to anyone. Um, great recall. I don't think she's ever, she spent five minutes on his recall. He is just that dog. Um, Darwin wasn't. Um, so I wasn't prepared for the challenges and the time it would require. I was naive to think my only problem with a male dog would be potentially humping. And, you know, I know that at about a year when he was one, I thought, gosh, you know, if you could just do that 10 hours a day, I would be fine. You know, I would be okay. But there was a whole lot of other issues. Um, and some of them we're still dealing with. Um, is very different, our life. But um, and how difficult it would be actually, because the difference with nonverbal human learners is how we define that. Um, they may be non-vocal, they may be not being able to speak, but they may have a different means of communication that we have established. And the other thing that we can do is we can prompt behavior. And you can't really prompt behavior with an animal. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean physical prompting, but I can give a model prompt. I can give an initiative model for the child to engage in the behavior and then bring it under the relevant source of control. So I have a tool of strategies that don't work with, at least, I mean, I, I, I don't work with animals. And I didn't know how to get behavior to occur other than through, you know, sticking a treat by his nose and, you know, moving him. But 
and sometimes not even like raw steak worked. Does that answer your question? Well, firstly, I thank you for answering it. And I think that it was a question which asked you to enter a vulnerable space in terms of talking with our audience and bringing your knowledge and experience here and, and humbly sharing your mm-hmm. journey with us. So uh, thank you for answering it. I hope it was okay for me to ask it. Yeah, it's fine. I mean... Cool. I got the feeling it was. But yeah, yeah. Just, uh, but I can, I can imagine a, a couple of things I can imagine. <laughs> I can imagine looking at Mickey, the bulletproof <laughs> dog of your, <laughs> of yeah. your acquaintance, and uh, you, I don't think you would be having the average human experience if you didn't compare yourself to that example. I think the listeners of this show can all relate to that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and I think different contingencies in play there because not only now for some people do you want to get the behaviours, but you also don't, you want to remove the embarrassment or the, the, the guilt, I sense you were sharing the guilt from. Yeah. Oh yeah, I had a lot of that. Um, and I can imagine for a, for a, a non-behavior analysis, someone with some other job has got nothing to do with strategically and intentionally working with behavior. I was about to say nothing to do with behavior, but I can't imagine many jobs that have nothing to do with behavior. Strategically and intentionally thinking about behavior, getting a dog and uh, having the Disney idea yeah. mm-hmm. in their mind. Um, so lucky Darwin ended up with you. And then you said that you went out and ex- explored whatever you could find before before Shirag and what you found mm-hmm. was information. You, you you learned about the quadrants. I did. I did learn about the quadrants. <laughs> I learned, I didn't know. I learned a new term. Uh, and, yeah. and then you, you did something potentially, though, that a lot of uh, trainers, especially generic average layman pet owner mm-hmm. uh, but a lot of trainers don't have the skill set or knowledge to do potentially mm-hmm. and that's figure out where that information connects or doesn't connect to the knowledge that you have about how behavior works yeah i'm curious about your perception of that t- that part of our industry if we're here working with learners as we are canines Mm -hmm. equines parrots exotics and we have and we're sharing tools and resources that as someone who can critically think about those in terms of how it relates back to the science Mm -hmm. and 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 were you were you saying am i interpreting this correctly were you saying that it, it you couldn't connect it not that it didn't connect, but they didn't have the verbal behavior to explain it beyond. Does that make sense? So the procedures that I was given to some extent were effective to some extent. But I guess what I wanted to know was, what is the analysis of the controlling variables here? When you tell me to toss a tree towards the distraction and then, you know, Darwin will pick up the tree and then turn to me. That was the end goal. What is each element? Where is the motivating operation? What does the tree function as? You know, what level of, you know, what is the underlying behavioral process? Um, it, for me, it wasn't sufficient to say it's operant conditioning. Fine. Yeah. Other than reflexes, most behavior that changes is operant, right? But but I, I wanted the breakdown. And so what I ended up doing, that's when things turned for me and Darwin. Before Eva, because um, I've known Eva for about a year and Darwin is three and a half. Um, a year and a half I've known Eva and I'm working with her. But I figured out that I needed to do that. I would take the procedures and I would literally break them down as to what is the establishing operation here? What is currently functioning as the controlling stimulus? What do I need to do? Am I looking to 
I, I did what I do for my kids. I did a functional analysis. I manipulated each element until I found the controlling variable. And then I developed the interventions or I matched the procedures that I could find to back to those principles. So it's not enough for me to say it's reinforcement because my question to my students when they say, oh, well, that behavior is being reinforced is what is the reinforcer? What is the behavior? What is the, what are, under which conditions does it happen? Under which conditions does the same behavior not happen? What are the establishing operations? What is, where it, what is the SD? What is the, the, stimul the discriminative stimulus that signals availability of reinforcement? And every procedure they put in place, they need to give me those elements all the way through. It's not enough for, for them to say, I'm going to use this procedure, I'm going to be doing this. My question is why and how does it relate back to behavioral principles? How, how is your procedure conceptually systematic? How does, your, how does each step of your technology mirror behavioral and processes and principles? Does that make sense? So I wasn't expecting that from the trainers I contacted who gave me a lot. They really supported me at certain times. I learned effective antecedent management. It just, but I, I couldn't see myself. I mean, I'm all for a life of martyrdom, but I don't like being a martyr. And I felt like that. I felt, oh, poor me with this dog. We have to go out five o'clock in the morning. And I just did not, it didn't work, of course. Um, but, and, and I understood the, the next part, but I guess I wanted something that most trainers can't quite do other than a special subgroup of clicker trainers, people like Eva. Um, and that's what I wanted. It just took me a long time to find it. Well, thanks, thanks for sharing. And within Animal Training Academy, I don't know or well, I can't think on the spot. For, I'm talking to the listeners now for anyone who might want to go back and look at this. I, I can't remember where or when we've talked about it in the podcast, but it's something we've definitely explored within our paid membership. And that's about the how to be how to be more of a critical thinker and how to ask why and how does this relate back to the principles and the science so that you, the listener, as a consumer of information on the interwebs and in conferences can pick apart the differences between a new shiny object that's being offered in the animal training world that is just the package or the principles that you're already applying repackaged in a different way. That's why we export it in the membership. Uh, and that's a antecedent for me that led me to ask that question. But it's got me curious uh, in terms of your perception because of your journey and your knowledge do you, do you see that as a problem that it's not being linked back to what I, I, you can you can hear no, no, that you no, see me uh, frame, no 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 i understand question. no and i think it's i think it's a, it's a good question and i think it's hard to articulate personally i didn't see it as a problem that um that I that I was being given a procedure because the procedure was effective. It it worked. But and I, I don't think I would I would say probably the most trainers, animal trainers, wouldn't wouldn't really be exposed to many caregivers that have my background so um who are so exigent about precision in in being conceptually systematic. I have built my whole career on not just producing good technology that is effective, but, and I guess this is what I, I strive to do every single day, is in what way can I account for every element? Um, can, I, can, I, can I account for every, every element uh, in a behavioral way? Okay. And, and I don't think that's necessary to... Um, you know, I've seen some really good trainers and some of the ones I've worked with um, 
It looks like they can do it. It's a bad word. I'm going to use it intuitively. Of course, it is not, there's no such thing as intuition, but they've accumulated so much experience that their behavior is under the control of the minimal change in the behavior of the learner. And, and, and they move in, in this way and it looks like magic. Uh, of course, it's not magic. Um, and so I would apply things, but I would spend then some time dissecting every element. And I was hoping, and in my quest of finding someone who could do it with me, um, I don't take instructions very well. Um, it's, I will, I will do it, uh, and I will do what I'm asked and I won't interrupt. And then when all is quiet, I will ask a million questions. Um, so I'm a good student in that I will do what I'm told because I can see that I'm the learner, that I'm not the one with the knowledge and the information you have is the reinforcer here because I don't have that. But um, it has to make sense to me behaviorally. And, and it didn't always, the explanation sometimes were about the internal state. And, you know, we're changing the emotion. Do this, we're changing the emotion. And as a radical behaviorist, I struggle with that terminology. And when I, and also what I didn't want to do, because I wanted the trainers to come back and help me, <laughs> so there was a bit of self-interest there, is I didn't want to school them. So I didn't want to tell them actually, um, so I didn't tell a lot of people what I did for a living because I didn't want to scare them away. Um, and so I would say yes. And then inside me, I would say, you're changing behavior. And if you change behavior, then whatever we infer from behavior may also change. Just keep saying that to yourself. Um, and don't question it. Said it, said it last, but again, you were saying to yourself, just do what they ask because you know it will work. You know that um, you are um, changing behavior, and as a result of that, the internal state we infer from behavior may also change. But you won't know until you change the behavior, and you can only infer that. So you had to tell yourself this to make yourself at peace of what was happening and not needing to know the answer. No, and I was fine with what was happening. I wasn't fine with the explanation. So it's, for me, it's, the doing was always great. I have, like, what I've been taught, there's a, it, you know, there's a life, my life as a, as a, you know, Darwin's caregiver, pre-Eva and post-Eva. Um, <laughs> it's true. You laugh, but it, it is true. Um, I, and so, so what I was doing was fine. Um, it was effective to some degree. Um, but the explanations didn't match what was happening. So the verbal behavior was different from what was actually happening, happening. The verbal behavior, the explanations I was being given as to why things would work. And it was always about changing the dog's emotion. And I, I just, I, I didn't see the need to point some inaccuracies out because they were there to help me and my dog and not to be lectured by me. Um, so, but it, you know, it was in my verbal repertoire, I thought about it. And um, uh, so I don't, I don't see it as a problem. But I think it is limiting to just have the procedures. It's a bit like, this is what I tell my students. So when, when my students come for mentoring, what they want is the procedure. They want, how do I teach this? Tell me the operations. Tell, give me the technology. How do I, what do I do when? And I could do if they were the parent. I would tell them what to do, 
we would work it out together. But I don't need to give them the whole spiel about selection by consequences, right? But my students is different because if I give you the procedure only, if I only give you the recipe and not teach you how to mix the ingredients together, you know, I can give you the recipe book, I can give you a curriculum and you can just follow that. And if you have a linear learner, you'll be fine. But most learners are not like that. And then you need to know how to program, how to mix those ingredients, not just pick them out of the cupboard and put them together because you have a list. So my job as a, as a, someone who trains behavior analysts is to teach them how to think behaviorally so that they don't need a manual. Manuals are useful. Curricula are useful. Procedures are useful because sometimes it's taxing to come up with your own all the time, especially if someone's published and shows that, you know, this particular technology is effective for establishing this repertoire. But then you're going to meet that one learner who doesn't fit that study of six participants of which three get it, two don't, one needs a change. And you have that one learner who doesn't fit any of those profiles and the study hasn't been published. What do you do? And you only have that recipe. You're going to have to come up with your own. And if you understand how to, if you can identify the controlling variables for behavior, for not just that specific behavior, but in general, the response classes, um, the relevant establishing operations and discriminative stimuli, then you can begin to manipulate them without following a recipe. And when it works, it will reinforce not just what you did then, but the thinking you put behind it as well, the verbal behavior, the problem solving um, process that you engaged in. And then it gets easier because you can recognize common elements. So I think it's, it's a lot of people after, and I can talk just, you know, I can't talk for animal trainers, but, um, you know, I've had students who maybe had been tutoring or, or had been RBTs, behavioral technicians. So doing the one-to-one -one intervention with kids for 10, 15 years. And then they decided to further their knowledge and maybe take on a master's. And, and what they often come back to me is saying, you know, they say, I now understand why that procedure worked. And there's a big difference between, okay, I'll do this. I'm just following these instructions. And now I know I can predict the outcome and I can control the outcome. There's a big difference. I think that what you've just shared will be helpful for many listeners of this show. And I say that because a question I get asked very regularly is from trainers who might fall into the category beginner or low level intermediate and are wanting to uh, explore a career in animal training and want to know whether they should enroll in university or what other options are available to them. Should they just go and volunteer at a shelter or a zoo or whatever relevant uh, industry is for them or maybe whatever is available in their local area? I can't imagine that the answer to the question is none other than it depends because everyone's so different and everyone's resources are different and there's so many variables that would make that answer different for different individuals. But what what are your thoughts on the industry in the future from where it is now and, and what educational pathways people should take? I think any, intro, even just an introduction, I don't think people need to necessarily go out and get a master's in behavioral analysis. Um, but any introductory course on behavior analysis, um, conceptual foundations. So not necessarily related to dogs or animals or people, 
just the conceptual foundations um, would really, it kind of alters your view of the world or the social world we live in because um, you begin to understand that behavior isn't inside a person. It is in their contingencies. And I, it's one of the things that I often tell my parents, um, the parents I work with, you know, when, when they say he is whatever, naughty, um, whatever, um, disobedient. And, um, and I said, well, we can look at it this couple of ways is either he is that and I can't change him because I, I can't, I can't manipulate the synapses. I can't manipulate the genetic, his genetics. Um, and, or we can look at it in a different way that the behavior turns on under certain conditions, doesn't turn on under different conditions. Sometimes it can be turned off. And if we accept that what we do in response or before um, alters the probability of emission of that behavior changes, um, then those things we can change. And if we change those things, then we may also see a change in the occurrence or non-occurrence of behavior. And, and it's a great tool to have. And the principle are general in that they transcend species. And then obviously you would need to know about the specific population you're working with um, to um, apply procedures derived from those principles in relation to that individual's, you know, repertoire, individual repertoire. Um, so I think they offer an interpretative lens that no other science, no other discipline that attempts to explain what we do and why we do it has. Well, if you, the listener, are questioning a learning opportunity or what learning opportunity or what approximation to take on your path to growing your training skills and knowledge, then hopefully that was helpful. I'm very sure it was. I have a million more questions, kind of like, yeah, it sounds you do when you're learning something, Francesca, but we only have limited attention spans as people drive to their consults and work and do the dishes and mow the lawns and whatever you're doing when you're listening to this podcast episode on. So for part one, we are blessed to have Francesca come back for another conversation. But we're going to wrap it up there for this episode. So thank you so much for sharing everything today, Francesca. Just before we do officially in part one, though, could you just share with everyone listening where they could go to find more about you online and slash or get in touch? Yes, they can find me on Facebook. So it's just my name, Francesca de Espinosa. Um, And I have a website although that mainly has my training events. Um, uh, and that would be abaclinic.net, but Facebook is probably the, the, you know, the most successful way. Um, and um, yeah, I generally check it. I try to limit it to once a day, but um, I will get a notification if there's a message. Or if people want to, um, you know, add me as a friend, then just let let me know uh, who you are <laughs> in terms of, you know, I listen to the podcast or I'm a, you know, animal trainer, um, and um, I I generally just say yes all the time. Wonderful. Well, we will link to all of your social media that you mentioned website and the show notes. So thank you for that. This has been a ton of fun, Francesca from myself and on behalf of everyone listening, we really appreciate you 
uh, sharing everything with us today, getting vulnerable and taking the time to come and hang out. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And thank you as well so much for listening. This is your host, Ryan Cartledge, signing off from this episode of the Animal Training Academy podcast show. It's our hope today's conversation sparked inspiration and added some tools to your trainer's toolbox. Remember, every training challenge is an approximation towards becoming a better trainer. Embrace the rough patches, learn from them, and keep improving. And don't forget, the path to growing your skills and expanding your knowledge continues beyond this episode. Visit www.atamember.com to join our waitlist and be the first to know when our membership doors open again. There you'll find a supportive community of trainers just like you, working to make a positive difference in the lives of animals and humans alike. Until next time, keep honing your skills, stay resilient, and remember, every interaction with an animal or human learner is your opportunity to create ripples. We're here cheering you on every step of the way. See you at the next episode.